Good evening, goeie naand, en baie welkom hier in die Zuid-Afrika huis. We are so pleased that you can join us this evening for our joint event, the second this year between Stellenbosch University and Zuid-Afrika huis. You know, I just want to tell you a little story. Um, in 2020, I had a call with uh, the director of the of the house, who at that time was new. She's called Angeli Sands, and then also with um, uh, some of the other colleagues here. And we had such a lovely conversation online saying that we would meet each other. But little did we know that, of course, in March 2020, we all started going into lockdown. And then we continued the conversation in 2021. The lockdown continued. And we continued the conversation at the end of 2021. And still there were some restrictions. And eventually, when we arrived in 2022, we said, perhaps this is the year that we can actually do our joint event. And so we had our first event in July. And then I was really delighted when we said, well, let's just do a second event in October when Johan Furi will visit us to present his book, Our Long Walk to Economic Freedom. So just to say that this evening has been planned for a while and we are really pleased that we can go ahead this evening. We're living in extraordinary times and I think this book that you will hear about this evening is also an extraordinary book. I have the pleasure this evening to say a warm welcome to Professor Jan van Loten, van Zouten van Loten, no, Loten van Zanden, there we go, let's try again. <laughs> Professor Jan uh, Loten van Zanden, who is a professor at the Utrecht University, Emeritus Professor, and is also an extraordinary professor at Stellenbosch University. He will be conducting an interview with Johan this evening, and I can tell you I have read Johan's book, and I so much want to give a spoiler alert, but I won't. It's, a, it's really a book worth reading, and it was really, for me, certainly a very thought-provoking book. The book you can buy this evening and Johan, I'm sure will, you will sign every copy being sold this evening. The book is going at 26 uh, euros 99. It can of course also be purchased on online or, or locally at the bookstore. But this evening you will have a, a special um, signature by the author himself. So I would encourage you to uh, take the opportunity and also just have a little chat and why not also a selfie with Johan this evening. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, I'm handing the microphone over to Jan Loten van Zanden. There you, I got it right this time. And Jan, we look very much forward to hearing your interview with Johan. Thank you very much. Good, good evening, uh, everybody. It's a real ple ple pleasure for me to be here in the South Africa house and to interview my good friend and colleague Johan uh, uh, about his book. I um, know Johan for a long time now, uh, I think from 2001, 2002, or not that much. 2008. 2008. Okay. But so we are part of the same conspiracy, I have to add. We are both economic historians and we have worked together quite a bit in the past although not as long as I thought we were <laughs> working together. Uh, but um, uh, so uh, I am looking forward to discussing uh, his book with him and with you. Uh, if you have questions or comments which are really contributing to the debate, please raise your hand and we'll uh, include you in the discussion. Um, I'm going to introduce Johan very briefly because if I have to go through his entire CV, it will take me more time than we have for the interview. But he is uh, one of the rising stars of uh, economic history. He is a professor, as you know, of economic history at Stellenbosch University. And he has developed a very broad research program on African, South African world economic history in the past. He. Uh, acquired his PhD at Utrecht University in 2012, uh, am I right, more or less, in the, uh, uh, about the Cape Colony and its wealth and poverty in the uh, mainly the 18th century. Um, and he since has been very active in all dimensions of the field. He has 
I made a list of his many qualities. Uh, he has been working with new digital and digitized sources. He is famous for his teamwork. He works with a large number of colleagues. Uh, students are his main source of inspiration. He uh, tells you in, in the book. And uh, you can really uh, notice this from the way he operates. He's a brilliant organizer of research and, and teaching. He has set up the LEAP network, which is uh, having a big impact. Uh, 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 in, in short, he has become uh, an international star within economic history. Uh, um, uh, uh, and he has uh, published now a book to establish his reputation about the long term developments in the world economy over a long time period of about 100,000 years. And that's what we are going to discuss. So the, the idea is that Johan will give a brief summary of his book in the next 10 minutes or so. And then I will start asking questions. And uh, well, we have a lively discussion about the ideas and the, of the book. Johan? Thanks, Janet, and thanks for uh, the invitation to be here. It's it's wonderful to have such a such a packed room, and and I hope also for a for a fascinating discussion. I think um, perhaps just to say some something about Jan Leighton uh, before before I talk about the book. Um, and so the the book that he read was the one that was published last year uh, by Tafelberg in South Africa, and uh, that one was um, uh, you know where I acknowledge the kind of contribution of students. Um, and this one is the one that's outside, is the one by, uh, that was published this year, a month ago, by Cambridge University Press. So it's, it's updated, it's got uh, about 10,000 words um, more. I could correct some of the mistakes I had made, I added another chapter. Um, and that one uh, is dedicated to my teachers. So Jan Leighton is my former supervisor at Utrecht, and so he's certainly one of the people that I include in in those dedications. Um, uh, and uh, just as a, as a side note, I think the, the way the world works is often very serendipitous, is the way we uh, uh, met was at an at a academic conference, very similar to the one that I'll be attending this week, where... Uh, um, I attended a meeting and uh, complained basically about the, the lack of uh, interest in uh, African economic history papers. And Jan Leighton put up his hand and said, well, why don't you send me the paper? I'll read it. And then he invited me to Utrecht and uh, the rest is history. So I think you remember the story slightly differently, but that's the way I remember it. Um, and that, that's why it's the truth. Um, what is the book about? Um, in 2020, when when COVID came, um, my course that I was teaching for the, had been teaching for the last uh, almost a decade for second year students had to move online as all courses had to. And it's, it's a course that is dedicated um, to kind of global economic history. I don't call it economic history because students typically don't like economic history or the word history, certainly. So we call it like long term development, um, economic development in the long run, these kinds of things. And uh, the nice thing about this course is that it's about 80 students or so, so there's nice discussions that's, that's usually, and we can talk about interesting topics, challenging topics sometimes. Um, but you can't really have that, those kinds of discussions online. And so I started writing up these lectures um, uh, and send it to the students. Um, and these students would come back and they would say, I really enjoyed the lecture, uh, but my brother also enjoyed it and my father really enjoyed it um, and I thought well maybe that's a book then rather than just a series of lectures so that's the kind of practical reason reason for why the book happened and what um, how it came about um, but I think fundamentally it's it's a book where those students for the last decade really I've realized are quite pessimistic about the world um, the world that South African students inhabit and I think many of you some of you might even have been in that class. Um, they see the world, uh, the South Africa that I know at least is a South Africa of pessimism, um, of South Africa since 2008, 2009. Um, uh, I have to remind myself that the students that are that will be in my class, my second year class next year, cannot remember the 2010 World Cup. They, it's, it's too old for them. It's too far in the distant past. 
So they don't know the South Africa that I knew of the 2000s, the South Africa with 4%, 5% economic growth. Um, they only know a, a world that is, that is negative, a, a country that is negative, and to some extent also a world. COVID has really shaped their worldview. Um, and so the purpose of the book was really to say, well, if we just take a step back and we just look at the long run, then we can see that actually the story of humanity over the last two decades, uh, decades, the last, last two centuries is a, is a story of immense progress, also the last three or four decades especially, but certainly over the last two centuries, uh, the world has not only seen a massive increase in the number of people alive, but the, um, also the kind of living standards, the relative income of those individuals have increased um, exponentially. Um, and so, of course, there are, it's not to say that there aren't major concerns, major issues, uh, which hopefully, you know, to some extent is also highlighted in the book, but we can be far more optimistic than we are. And then the purpose of really these chapters is to kind of take you through these historical events, thinking about what caused them, what are the economic uh, uh, underpinnings of, of some of the historical events that we think of, that we typically attribute to kind of political events, um, and what are the consequences? How do those historical events still shape us, still shape us today? So that's a very rough 35 chapters, um, some with nice clickback titles. Um, and um, yeah. Okay, um, let's let's start with discussing some of the ideas from the book. But first of all, I would like to stress that it's, it's a real pleasure to read it. Uh, I told you before, but this is just for on the record, so to say. It, it is very well written. It's very transparent. There's a lot of humor. Uh, there are very nice examples and very nice stories in the book. So uh, it's a very good read. And not many uh, economic historians uh, have the ability to write in such a transparent and accessible way. But now let's, let's move on to the serious uh, stuff and talk about the book. I already told you that I think there are, in a way, three stories in the book, three long-term stories about economic development. One is um, about the world as a whole. That's good news. Uh, that's the, the great enrichment, as uh, Deirdre McCloskey called it, perhaps also your long uh, walk. Uh, the, the world has become much more prosperous and wealthy than it was the 200 or 500 years ago. This, the second uh, part of the story is, uh, in, in a way, the bad news, or perhaps um, not so bad news, but not entirely good news either. That's the story about Africa in the Great Enrichment. Why was it much less successful than other parts of the world? I think that's another topic that we could discuss. And the third one, uh, clearly, is the South African part of the story, which is somewhat different from the African part. South Africa had it, its own particular growth path. Um, uh, uh, perhaps had the potential for being the Jap Japan of Sub-Saharan Africa, but it didn't manage to develop in such a way. So in all three stories, there are historical causes why this part of the world or the world as a whole developed as it did. And I think it will help the audience to understand the book better if we can try to isolate them a bit. So what would be, in your opinion, the main reasons why South Africa develops so differently from, let's say, the world as a whole, or, or Western Europe, or the United States? What made South Africa into the kind of economy that it is now? Yeah, I, I think uh, a, a good co a colleague that we both know quite well, Joel Mokier, summarizes mm -hmm. his book on the Industrial Revolution with the kind of two lessons that we have learned as humanity for that, that explain the wealth and poverty of nations. And that is that we should use our understanding of nature, what you might call science, to make people more productive. And the second thing is that we should uh, ensure that that the surplus that that productivity creates should be shared by everyone. It shouldn't be expropriated by an elite. Now, I think the story of the US and of Europe is, is the application of both of those lessons. Mm -hmm. That 
um, you know, Europe, and this is a story that Joel Nokia tells, and in your new book, that's also a story that you tell of the Netherlands and, and kind of broader societies in Western Europe, is this application of science and then how that spreads um, kind of beyond a, a small enclave to, to make everyone more prosperous. South Africa has probably had learned the first lesson that we, we should uh, use our scientific knowledge to make us more productive, but we didn't learn the second one. And that is that we excluded a large part of our population from benefiting from these surpluses um, that we created. Um, and, and some might say, well, you know, the first can't happen with the second. And I think that's not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably something worth exploring more. But I do think um, the unique case of South Africa is, a, is a, a very good example. And to some extent, there's similar cases in Latin America where mm -hmm. you do see this creation of prosperity, but for a, for a small elite compared to uh, in in uh, in Europe, certainly in the in the US, of course, there's also high levels of inequality, but there's certainly more inclusive growth than the, than we had in South Africa. So I think, you know, very in in short, that that is the mm -hmm. main constraint, and it's only since 1994 that we that we have uh, opened up the um, the rights and the abilities of everyone in South Africa mm -hmm. to benefit from these surpluses. And then in fact, what you know, what I would what I say in the book also is that we did see immense progress and we forget this. This is the frustration for me is that we did see immense progress in the late 1990s, early 2000s, up until 2008 um, of massive increases in um, living standards across South Africa. I mean, poverty fell like a, a standard measure of poverty fell from 37% um, to 17 or so. And then if you have a multidimensional index of poverty, it fell even further. Mm -hmm. So so real improvement, um, the share of, BD, uh, of GDP that was sent, that was given as social transfers increased, um, people were benefiting from this rapid growth. I mean, even in 2007, when Elon Musk had just found a Tesla, South Africa had an electric car at the Paris Motor Show, the Jewel, which was, you know, it was the darling of the show. Um, so we were heading in the right direction and, and then that changed around. So, um, so there's two answers to the story. The one is this kind of more longer term story mm -hmm. of exclusion and growth. And the other one is, uh, a post 1994 of inclusion, but then a turnaround, the reversal. Let's go back in time and, and, and have a look at the, the, the long, uh, story. Um, when did it go wrong in a way? So was the introduction of slavery in the 17th, 18th century already the first sign that the, the, uh, that the, 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 this economy was not on the right track? Um, do you believe in past dependency in that sense that uh, once you have an economy which is characterized by slavery, that you are bound to have problems in the, in the future as well? I think there's certainly merit in to, to say that it's not, it doesn't make things easier to mm -hmm. when, when, but I don't think it's, it's, you know, it's necessarily destiny. I think the U S is still today, the United States is still the, you know, leading economy in the world and, um, and have very high levels of, um, income per capita, even though there are also high levels mm -hmm. of inequality and exclusion, um, and, and, uh, other, uh, issues as well. The Cape is to some extent the same. It, of course, was a slave economy, um, but then it was also an economy that had uh, emancipated its slaves by 1834, 1838, um, and in fact had given voting rights to a non-racial franchise. I think many people forget, many think that South Africa only had a non-racial franchise in 1994, but of course, uh, already from the 1850s, uh, the Cape uh, colony had a non-racial franchise. Of course, it could only be men that could vote. And there were other uh, qualifications at a certain income level and, and later on um, also uh, literacy. But that model certainly, a model of increasing, again, uh, participation, this, you know, what I would call kind of increasing economic freedom, mm -hmm. attached to that is political freedom, but it meant also uh, expansion of schooling, um, um, and not only to uh, to white South Africans or citizens then at that stage of the Cape Colony. Um, and certainly that was a model, I think, that would have 
had that continued into the 20th century, we would have had a profoundly different society than the one that, that then happened when 1910 came. Uh, those rights uh, were lost and uh, South Africa became a uh, uh, union with predominantly only whites, where only white could, whites could vote. So, so that shift, and, they, and there's a whole chapter in the book about why that mm. happened and, and, and the kind of political and economic interests that are behind. And again, you know, there I would make the case that we think of it, these events as, you know, political events. Um, we attach kind of cultural values, values to them, but ultimately it's basically because of the high debt that the Cape Colony had. Um, and the only way that they could repay this debt was to um, unify with the, with the, um, the poor republics who had obviously the gold, um, the former poor republics who had obviously lost the war, but they, these poor republics, even though they had lost the war, had quite a lot of bargaining power because of these, these gold and diamond deposits. And so um, it's an economic underpinning of, of why these political rights for, for black voters were let go. Um, so I think, you know, those kinds of um, shifts in history do have long term mm. consequences, but I don't think necessarily that you know what happens in even though I you know love the 18th century and early 19th century, I don't think necessarily what happens there inevitably shapes what comes mm. 200 300 years later. So there was a kind of window of opportunity in the middle of the 19th century to develop into a different direction, and so what what really made it change course. Then you you do not discuss, if I remember correctly, the resource curse literature, which links the availability of resources to changes in institutional structures. Uh, would that not be an, an obvious way of looking at it, especially when you think also about the apartheid era, which is mm -hmm. so dominated by the, 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 the gold mines and the diamond uh, mm -hmm. mines of, uh, of the country? I think the resource curse, um, and I would need to think more about this, but I think the resource curse has a is only one mechanism, right? And that's through the kind of exchange rate to some extent. So, or do you, okay, do you? Well, I think there's another version of the resource curse literature which says that uh, uh, it leads to institutional de deterioration. So a small elite can capture the, the state mm. and, and not raise any taxes which are, uh, need some democratic yeah. approval, but uh, get its income from the, the natural resources. And that seems to fit the South African case yeah. nicely, perhaps. The Cape Colony case, yeah. Yeah, at the, at the, yeah I'm, I'm not entirely sure that that fits the, the 20th century South Africa case mm. uh, perfectly. But certainly the story of the 19th century uh, diamond mines that fits mm -hmm. the story of the, of the Beers and Cecil John Rhodes, who was governor of the Cape and then obviously also um, owner of the Beers, who basically paid no tax. Um, and so, but used government resources to fund the railway construction, which was the very expensive thing, which, which meant there's a lot of debt in the colony. And so that's why ultimately the only solution for Cecil John Rhodes was war because he needed the, the income from the, the, um, the Transvaal mines to pay for this, the government debt. So I, I, I think, I think in that context, sure, the the resource curse um, is a is a what is a good example um, or a good explanation for for what we observe. But I think in in twentieth century South Africa, I'm not entirely sure that that's again the the only version of the story that one can tell. So so. These diamond mine, uh, these gold mines, especially by the 1930s, 1940s, were very profitable, but they were also paying significant tax. So a good example again is South Africa steps leaves the gold standard in 1932, and a massive increase in the gold price, massive boom uh, for for tax revenue for Johannesburg, and and only three or four years later, Soweto, southwestern townships can be constructed because of these uh, taxes that the, the municipality of Johannesburg now receives. Um, so so that to me, again, is not necessarily, that doesn't inevitably signal that um, that by, you know, within 10 years or 12 years later, you'll see uh, an apartheid government. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are other 
war-related effects, uh, which explains this the rise of this kind of uh, far-right, um, initially quite marginal group, and then um, they win the, the elections with 37%. So, so I don't, again, I don't want to attribute kind of, you know, uh, a path dependency necessarily to the resource curse. Um, you have a nice chapter, or nice chapter, but a good chapter about apartheid about apartheid as well. Could you um, elaborate a bit what the long-term economic consequences of, of apartheid are for South Africans' economic development? How did it hurt or did it hurt the economy and how did it hurt the economy in the long run? Uh, because that is, I think, a, a very a, a important part of the, the 20th century story. Mm. Yeah, I think it gets back to this uh, this idea of Mokia, right? That this idea mm -hmm. that you cannot really prosper as a society if most of your people are excluded from its productive capacity. Now, the idea that in the 1950s and 60s that Favut certainly had was that there would be an economy with skilled workers and then they would be supported by a, a large pool of unskilled workers. And so the whole education system was shaped to create that uh, economy, basically. And if you look at the 1920s, 1930s, sure, that was exactly what the economy was like. There was a small pool of, uh, pool of skilled labor, vast numbers of unskilled labor, because that's the whole system, how it worked at that stage, right? You needed unskilled workers in the mines, you needed unskilled workers as factory workers. But by the 1950s and 60s, exactly the time that many of these apartheid policies were implemented, that, that the whole economic structure, not only in South Africa, but elsewhere in the world, had shifted. The economy became far more services economy and for services industries you need skilled workers or semi-skilled workers and so the kind of economy that he tried to create was very different from the economy that was actually needed or was kind of changed it was changing into um and so you know re re apart from all the kind of uh, discriminatory uh, um, uh, policies the idea that uh, you could you could, through an education system, create a society which is so unequal and that that would be good for economic growth was just fundamentally flawed uh, by by that stage. Um, and, and so it did. I mean, and the thing is that this, as soon as this was realized, and by certainly by the late 60s, early 70s, many uh, were aware that this is, you know, this is not working anymore. Something needs to change. But then, by, by by then, these kinds of you know labor unions, for example, because only whites could vo uh, could vote, white labor unions had a lot of political power, and they could prevent changes from happening. They could, for example, there's something called the color bar, where you could only employ white South Africans in semi-skilled and skilled work, um, and they could prevent that policy from changing uh, simply because they had a lot of political clout. So again, if you only give a small section of your population the ability to vote, political rights. Um, then it's much easier to to persist with those kinds of uh, unequal economic outcomes. One of the points that you make in the same chapter, if I remember correctly, is that the international boycotts didn't matter a lot. They did not have a big impact. I was a bit surprised by that because I thought that isolated both economically and culturally uh, the, the country quite a lot. So why this assessment that it didn't matter that much? Can you explain yeah, it a bit? There, there are two ways to think about this. The first is, I mean, just to question back, I guess, is that do we think that uh, the sanctions on Robert Mugabe had helped to um, facilitate regime change? I'm not sure. Mm. Um, to some extent, you might say that gave him legitimacy. You could point at the West and say, look how they're trying to undermine us. Um, uh, but there are more sophisticated theories uh, for apartheid South Africa where they show basically that uh, sanctions benefit some and uh, are to the de detriment of others. And typically it's, you know, those that lose out are far more numerous. But if those that benefit are a small share or are in government, um, and so if, for example, if your leaders benefit, um, then they have an incentive to continue with these, uh, with the you know whatever um, the sanctions are against, and so um, you know these theories basically for the 1980s suggest that that those sanctions um, hurt most of the South African economy for most whites and of course for black South Africans, but um, but benefited a small share of um, 
uh, of white South Africans, and those were the ones that had political power. Um, and so again, this the system actually the sanctions actually just um, uh, kept it in place, the system, rather than dismantling it. Um, it's a theory, right? Of course, it's very difficult to think of a counterfactual, but certainly there's, there's a lot of attention to that now. We have Russian yeah. sanctions. There's a new book uh, by uh, uh, Agatha de Marais that's coming out on, I think it's called Backlash on Sanctions. Mm -hmm. um, does it work? So I think um, apartheid South Africa in that case, the 1980s at least, is a good um, testing ground for many of these theories. Yeah, one of the differences between Zimbabwe and South Africa is, of course, that South Africa had a rugby team which wanted to compete internationally. And I'm not sure, but I, I'm, I don't know a lot about rugby, but I don't think Zimbabwe had such a team, so that might have a very important, different impact. Anyway, the other thing that you mentioned in one of your replies was that until 2008 or things went well in South Africa and then growth stopped. So what happened? Why mm. after the, the, the first 10, 12 years yeah. of economic growth? Well, I, would like, I would love to ask the audience, I guess, what their, what their view is on this. Uh, but, but basically it's a, it, it's a political change. Um, uh, obviously the same political party, but uh, certainly an, a shift in the economic priorities uh, away from uh, private sector-led growth to a, you know, a, what was called then a developmental state. The idea that the state should um, should take charge of the economy and uh, and growth um, and and. To some extent, there were good some some good ideas. It obviously followed the um, global financial crisis, and and at that stage, there was a lot of um, sympathy for the government to play a role. There was a lot of concern that the private sector, given the financial crisis, might not be the best uh, driver, if I can use that word, of the of economic growth. But certainly, the one the way that it was implemented in South Africa was. Uh, a larger state, uh, I think there's, I forget the exact numbers, but but I think the um, salaries of government employees increased 20% faster than private sector mm -hmm. employees. Um, and a lot more government employees were, were, uh, were given jobs. Uh, and then, of course, the infiltration uh, of state and entities by politically collect, uh, connected um, uh, individuals that that had only uh, an intention of of extraction um, uh, as fast as possible, um, and we still live through the consequences of that. Right. So the those of us who, who live in South Africa at the moment would would know that this year is the, by far the largest uh, number of load shedding hours, um, um, and the state uh, powered uh, utility or the state owned uh, power utility. Um, uh, is still, you know, is still struggling as as are many other state-owned companies. So, um, it's a, you know, it's we've we'd hoped by the end of uh, of twenty eighteen that um, that there would be a reversal. But it it clearly that the the magnitude of the of the of um, the corruption um, was so large that it's it's taken a while to to turn around. Okay, um, let's switch to the good news that I distinguished at the, at the beginning, the, the story about the great enrichment, the fact that the world has become so much more wealthy in the last 200, 300 years. Um, you already mentioned very briefly what Joe Mock here, his analysis of this was, but um, you didn't uh, tell us yet why this then happened in Western Europe or in England. So what, what's your take on uh, this? Uh, <laughs> Special uh, development. I should ask that question to you, Jan Leighton. It's not. It shouldn't be this way around. Well, I didn't write the book. <laughs> <up>. <laughs> um, why England and why uh, why then? Why the 18th century? Well, I I think there are perhaps it's useful to say that of course this is an age old question. It's not you know this is not the we're not the first to think about this, and I'm pretty sure we're not the last. There are various theories as to why that it happened. Uh, some of them are mentioned in the book. Um, 
and they range from as simple as it paid to invent. I think the key is invention and innovation and, you know, the things, this understanding of nature uh, in the broadest sense possible. The idea that we can use science, the ability to um, to understand the world, to, to, to produce uh, things in a more efficient way um, and, and and to encourage that innovation across all of society it's right it's not again a a process that is limited to a specific group of people or to certainly to an elite that that um, can only extract those surpluses for themselves um you know so the spinning jenny is invented by an illiterate person right so th the fact that that can happen is is amazing so on the one hand the one theory would say well it paid him to invent that simply because um in england at that stage wages were very high and so it you know if you can get a machine that can replace labor that's fantastic right so then you, you if you invent this machine then you don't have to employ so many people and so um you can be far more productive and and make a profit others would say well well that you know just pushes the question back so why were wages so high why was it um uh you know uh, uh, england so urbanized for example at that stage um Joel Mokier would say this is this kind of scientific um, culture um, and culture is of course a loaded word so one should be very careful when you use it but I think it is this idea that that um, uh, to some extent is also linked to language which uh, Deirdre McCloskey which was also mentioned earlier mentions uh, I think always about this like how do we talk about science in South Africa at the moment um, if you if you look at the budget speeches of our ministers of finance over the last 20 years and look at how often the word science had been mentioned it's it's almost never it's it's not part of our lexicon the idea that we should build a scientific society a society that invents and make people more productive whereas in you know if you go to israel for example where they spend five percent of their gdp on on and research and development it's all about science it's all about innovation and thinking about ways to make people more productive and so to some extent this is a little bit what happens in england that there's the shift through the enlightenment through uh, the republic of letters all of these kinds of things that happen that the people start talking about it um, i think deirdre mentions the example of if you read shakespeare the who's the merchant of venice right it's this evil guy right Whereas if you read Jane Austen, now 400 years later, 18th century England, it is, or 19th century England, it is, the, the merchant is this noble guy, right? He's, it's a good thing if you sell and if you buy and sell. Whereas 400 years earlier, it was a bad thing. And it's that change in the way we perceive entrepreneurs. And so the question, I mean, here in the Netherlands, you know, this is a society of entrepreneurs. It's part of what your book is about, eh? the pioneers of capitalism, right? This is where... The idea that you know entrepreneurship is should be celebrated whereas you know the question i have is in south africa do we celebrate it to some extent you know in the town that i'm living in stellenbosch it's this town of innovation it's a town of entrepreneurship this is you can sit in any coffee shop and you would see entrepreneurs come in and make deals and talk about new innovations and being productive but that's certainly the exception in south africa rather than the rule and i think in societies that prosper this is this should be the rule one of the nice uh, um, pictures that you, you you give is that there is a d distinction in uh, a difference in looking at the economy from the perspective as a monopoly game or as a settlers of Catan game. Can you elaborate this a bit? How this uh, yeah. this is used in your book? Yeah, I think it's. I mean, we've all played Monopoly, and it's a team of four or five or six people that. Everyone starts with equal amount of money and then you end up with one person winning and everyone else crying, right? It's um, it's usually a very uh, fraught uh, game. Where Settlers of Catan is very different. You have everyone start with one, those of you who've played Settlers with no one village and one road. And by the end of the game, there's still one winner, but everyone else also has a thriving empire, right? And so I think we... I mean, I, you know, I think sometimes the world can be divided into people who see everything as a zero-sum game, as a monopoly game. So if you win, if there's an Elon Musk, it means he must have stolen all of that wealth from someone else. 
Um, and it's to me, that's certainly not how the world works. It might have worked in certain places in certain times like that. So I'm not saying that it never worked like that. Uh, but it's certainly, if you think of, we are all 18 times more affluent than we were 200 years ago. And there's eight more, a factor of eight, more of us than they were. So it's not as if the rich people could have stolen from the poor, right? Because we are just, the total amount of wealth has so far exceeded what we were, what was available 200 years ago. So it must be like a Settlers of Catan game. Um, our, my wealth depends on everyone else's. That's why in a rich society, people are incredibly interdependent, right? You cannot be self-sufficient in a rich society then you're not rich, right? You can't, I cannot produce my own things, my own clothes, my own housing. Uh, then I would be poor uh, because I would be terrible at it. Um, uh, you can only be rich if you're interdependent. Um, that's why COVID was such a big shock because suddenly we were forced to isolate and do, our th do things ourselves. And that made us poorer. It didn't make us richer. Um, so the idea that we should, um, the, you know, to think of wealth as something as just being an, uh, acquired through exploitation, I think is is um, is inhibits your own ability to thrive. Shall we turn also to Africa for a moment? Yeah. Um, and and there is um, uh, a part of the the globe which has not participated. Uh, equally into the great enrichment. It has become more wealthy, but not uh, comparable to what has happened in other parts of the world. The big debate is probably if this has been caused by external factors like slavery, like colonialism, or by uh, uh, indigenous uh, causes, like uh, the difficult access to the sea, low population density, uh, disease environment and so on. Um, what would be your assessment after balancing these various causes of the lack of development or underdevelopment perhaps? Mm. Yeah, I think of Africa as a continent that um, has not prospered yet, right? So if you if you put it in that way, then then there are factors that have inhibited African growth. Um, and to some extent, they are episodes where African countries, several African countries have done very well. The post 2000s is a good example, rapid growth and then periods of decline again. So to me, it's almost more interesting to think of why do these economies not continue to grow, right? What is the explanation for this re reversal? And so the first thing then to note then is if there are these fluctuations, then it cannot be just one thing that happened 500 years ago and still explains things today because, um, well, then you need to explain this variation across time, which is the kind of thing that I think is the, the more interesting thing to explain. Um, not to say that those things didn't in, put in put a lot of hurdles in place that prevented kind of long-term growth, but I do think we need to think harder about um, uh, why there are these growth reversals, why periods of, you might even call it decay, like, you know, that um, things fall apart is the famous kind of line. Um, I do want to say, though, that uh, the one thing that we miss of uh, Africa, so firstly, there, there has been income per capita increases over the last 200 years. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that there's also been a massive population boom, right? So the, the, amount, of, the amount of resources on the continent that's been uh, kind of created has not only, it's not only that the uh, numerator is increased, but it's the denominator is increased quite rapidly as well. So the per capita has maybe not increased as fast as the rest of the world. But actually, the total amount of uh, income has actually increased quite substantially. So, um, you know, I am an optimist, I guess, uh, at heart. Uh, but I do see a lot of positive signs for, for the continent. Um, there are major demographic changes that are happening compared Africa to any other country or any other continent in the world. And you'll, and you'll certainly see that in future, the world is going to be Africa, right? So if you think about places, for example, I, you know, I um, always mention to Alison that if you are, if you want to make a case for Stellenbosch University, Stellenbosch University is the best research, research university on the continent. Where is going to be, where 
our future students are going to come from well for the rest of, for the entire world they're going to come from africa in 50 or 100 years time um and so you know this is the reason why you want to invest in stellenbosch is basically because we are going to be at the forefront of receiving the top students in the world um uh, at our institution and that's that's it's somehow frightening but it's also incredibly it's an incredible opportunity for us um uh to to service uh the uh, you know a future a future continent so so uh, there are there have been many kind of historical episodes that have impeded growth um let's not just call it growth let's say they, that have impeded both the adoption of um uh the science this understanding of nature right this first thing that i said that we need to make us more productive and secondly, the expansion of that knowledge to everyone on the continent. So, so all these historical things that we've mentioned limits that ability. I think it's our challenge, and I say our, it's those of us who are fortunate to, you know, to teach on the continent. It's our challenge now to both expand that productive knowledge and to expand its reach. So the depth and the breadth of, of knowledge, um, because that's the only way that, that we'll see um, uh, a continuous increase in, in living standards. Okay, excellent. Um, perhaps there are questions from the audience. We have covered uh, large parts of world history, and I can't imagine that it's all uh, without any debate. So, who would like to ask a question or raise a, make a comment? Uh, please. Oh, sorry. Yes, we're working with a mic. Good evening, my name is Yaku. Um, I want to ask a question about the elephant in the room, the long decline of ESCOM. Do you have, um, why do you think we are in this position? And do you have any advice to how to resolve this issue? Thanks. So let me put make the optimistic case. There are many pessimistic cases, so you, you you'll find in any number of articles on on the internet about it. But the optimistic case is, is if something becomes more expensive, people switch. Right, and so the most expensive thing if, is if it's not available. Um, so if we wanted to become a society that moves to renewables fast, what is the best way to do that? Well, it's to switch off the power. Because suddenly everyone is trying to get solar panels. So I'm not saying, you know, this is what this is the only way that you can move to a, a, an alternative model. But what I what will happen is that there will be innovation um, that they, you know, people will adopt. Um, and they are adopting and, and I say people, I mostly mean firms and big firms, mining companies are putting up solar panels. They're building up solar panel farms. They're investing in alternative uh, other sources of alternative energies. Um, so if you if you wanted to have some form of forced innovation, then this is the best way of doing it. Basically, it's obviously uh, incredibly hurtful, right? It's not nice to live in a society where there are continuous power cuts. But it's but it's also pushing us in direction which I hope will have long term positive consequences that we don't arrive. So if there weren't any power cuts, would there have been any changes, any shift towards renewables? We would still have the same ESCOM coal-fired power plants than we had 5, 10, 20 years ago. Um, so potentially through the darkness, there might be a little shiny solar panel at the end. Yeah. That's a very nice optimistic interpretation. Please. Sure, thanks. Um, you uh, spoke about the three, the sort of long history, South African history and African history, and about the role of uh, innovation and science and then sharing it. Um, do you also consider the role of finance and whether it, whether it leads that growth or lags that growth? So if you look at industrialization, it's great to invent the steam engine or the cotton gin, but until somebody could come along and put like serious amounts of money together to build railway lines, you couldn't really exploit that. Um, and South Africa, of course, has a, a very sophisticated financial system. 
Um, whereas the rest of Africa, that's certainly one of the variables that's really lacking. Um, so is that something that you would comment on and consider and does, what is the role of, of finance, mortgage markets, long-term project finance in actually creating that wealth? Sure, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I feel like I should throw this to you again. I mean, I'm not sure whether it leads or lags. I think you can make a case for both. I think you can say, well, there wasn't a sophisticated financial system in South Africa until we discovered gold and suddenly there was, right? Or diamonds. So clearly it, it kind of lagged. We first had to discover these things and then we could get the financial system. Alternatively, you might say, well, uh, that's not entirely true. There was to some extent some form of banking system. You know, the work that we're doing on the 18th century shows that there's the super dense informal financial network. The British came, they adopted these kinds of institutions. They created banks after the emancipation of the slaves. So already there were some um, financial systems in place and, and the discovery of diamonds just exacerbated these kind of uh, moves into the interior. So it's not, it's not clear to me. What I, what I perhaps will say about the rest of Africa is that, I mean, it's similar to the previous question, right? So if there's nothing that, that uh, leads to it forces almost innovation. So the most exciting fintech uh, uh, opportunities are now, I mean, if you just look at all the unicorns that are in Nigeria and Kenya, Ghana, in fintech at the moment, they're all in financial services. Um, so sure, they might not have a very sophisticated formal banking sector, but clearly there's this informal, something is brewing. Um, and, and to some extent, you know, even with mobile payments, we were, South Africa was a bit behind because we didn't need it. We had these other more formal. So, so potentially, I'm not sure where that might go. Whether you know, these are, this is also just a, a kind of startup craze, and maybe that blows over. And and but it does feel like there's something um, innovative happening in that space. Again, it's often in spaces where there's no government regulation, or not at least very serious government regulation, um, or at least participation. So, um, so again, the optimistic case would be well. Um, the fact that there aren't many players in the market, uh, formal banks might make it easier for like disruptive industries to come in. Um, yeah, so, uh, but you're right. I mean, to some extent, uh, if you want to build, uh, you know, a, a new office block, fintech is probably not going to be the, the guys to fund you. So, so it's it's not entirely clear to me to what extent this is useful for like consumer spending versus like investment. Um, uh, that's, I think, a much larger debate and probably one that, that we need more research on. In the back there, yeah. Okay, I, I'm, uh, let's say, Vili. Um, Thank you. It's, it seems very interesting. I'm actually really interested in, in reading your book, and I'm not economic. I'm an engineer, so I know nothing about economics. But my question is, you um, you mentioned that, and, and we see over so many regimes, there's always this clash between politics and economics. The Verwoerd, um, you know, the Verwoerd regime had the problem, Zuma had the problem. And it seems like we learned the lesson between state and judicial but not between state and economics. So when are we going to start learning that lesson and splitting the two? Yeah, that's a, um, I'm not sure we're going to always, we, or, we're ever going to learn that lesson, partly because I don't think even economic historians are convinced that, mm -hmm. that we, that there is a lesson to learn, right? So, the, so the one way to, to view the Asian miracle certainly is with a heavy hand of the state, right? So many would say, well, look at what happened in South Korea, and that clearly is not an example of only private enterprise, a state that had a, had a big role to play, um, or in Singapore, or other kinds of economies that took off quite, I mean, you might even say in Africa, Rwanda uh, is, a, is a, you know, since 1994, a country that has, that has done seemingly on, 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 uh, on the available statistics, although there's question marks about that statistics, but um, have done very well um so it does it's not entirely clear when the state should be involved and and when should it not i think it's you know i'm gonna 
I think it's uh, and uh, Jan Leiten has done research on like how often uh, dictators, um, you know, would who stay in office too long clearly have a negative effect on their um, a country's development. Um, but that's not to say that the state shouldn't have any role, right? There's there's certainly merits for for providing you know the basic what we would call public goods. Um, uh, uh, things like infrastructure, these kind of things, rules and regulations that are fair. Um, uh, and where exactly this line is between the state involvement and and um, private sector is is a matter of a society that needs to decide for themselves. Um, it's not it's not entirely clear that there is a precise definition. So we are going to swing between these. You know extremes but that sometimes in some places is, it is extreme like in latin america there are cases where it does feel like the swings are quite big in other places the swings are quite um small but i don't think it's just an answer about oh here is the exact line um i don't know if you want to add maybe something well i could add that the, the, the issue is probably not that, that those econ economics and politics will also always be interlinked and interrelated and there will uh, but um, it depends on the countervailing uh, powers of the rest of society to control and to check what is uh, really happening and i think that's 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 uh, vital for the the end result of the process if this is uh, not available then everything may go wrong but if it's done in a transparent way and uh, there is a lot of checks and balances within the political system i don't think it's a problem that economics and politics, uh, well, are so much interlinked with each other. Yeah, does that address your question a bit? A bit. <laughs> yeah, you want to come back? Okay. The, yeah. Um, thanks. My name is Brennan Furi. And uh, I would like to ask a question, I think, for, for most of us in, in Amsterdam, in London, etc. It's all about the brain drain South Africa's facing, you know. So many young professionals are leaving the country. Is this something that South Africa can adequately protect itself from? Should I? Um, so it is, I mean, it's, it, it, there's certainly something to worry about, right? The, the fact that you're losing your smartest talent. But I think there's, they, one should think about the word losing. So are we losing them, right? By, by when, when some of the smartest South Africans leave and they come and work in far more productive places, it's not that they entirely sever their ties. Um, I mean, some surely do, right? But others keep on, um, keep connections back home, uh, they might even not settle here permanently and they build up enough capital to come back and start something new, which they would never have been able to do at their state back home. They bring new networks, they bring new ideas, they bring new technology. Um, what the fascinating statistic the other day that I saw is like we, you know, I mentioned to you that a lot of South Africans are also immigrating to, to New Zealand, but New Zealand is actually losing far more people than they're gaining, right? So we tend to think of... Um, uh yeah we only look at the one way something perhaps to keep in mind is that for much of our history we were well the last two generations we were isolated right before 1994 you couldn't move really um and and now you can and so for us it's quite strange that people immigrate whereas for almost all other societies this happens continuously there's continuous migration in and out um, I don't think our numbers are that much higher than, in fact, I don't think they're at all higher than like the global average of people that immigrate and migrate. So this is perhaps just a, uh, I want to almost say a return to normal than it is an aberration. Um, but you're right that if there are an exorbitant or a disproportional number of people that are leaving the country um, uh, and, and leaving so permanently, then that obviously has implications, especially also kind of the immediate fiscal implications in terms of taxes and these kind of things. Um, uh, yeah. One final question. Yeah. yeah. 
I am. I'm Vainand. Um, also Vainand Furi. A lot of Furis here. Um, so I think my, my final question is probably not so technical. I think it's like, let's uh, do have one of your books um, and only have time to read one chapter. Which, which chapter should that be? Maybe not the last one. I think that's always the easy answer. Mm -hmm. Chapter 15, which is about um, what uh, an Indonesian volcano, Frankenstein and Shaka Zulu have in common. Um, and let them last because you don't believe the story. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> I, I like the story a lot. And, and it's one of the nice things about the book that such bizarre stories are brought together into one big story. And, and that makes it uh, fun reading. And I'm sure if you have read chapter five, 15, you will also read the other chapters as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for all. Uh, for your uh, contributions. I, I think I should thank you uh, uh, very much, Johan, for your excellent uh, answers to all the questions that I asked you. I think it has become very clear how broad the coverage of your book is and how important the book is. And I hope you are all are going to read the book and buy the book first, of course. So thanks also for, uh, thanks, uh, for the organization for doing this all so efficiently. Yeah, And the final thing I would say is that Jan Leighton's book is coming out in a week or two. <laughs> Pioneers of Capitalism. So the origins of capitalism, if you want to understand that, then Jan Leighton and Martin Prack. It's the it's a Magnus Opus. Well, that's your word. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone.